My name is Jeff Morgan. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I want to talk a little bit more about National Whistleblower Appreciation Day, which is uh, July the 30th, 2022. And um, with part of this presentation, I want to talk about uh, whistleblowing in an age of family court injustice and abuse. And I got the idea from some of this stuff because I listened to uh, a lecture with Tom Mueller, uh, Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud. He spent seven years writing a book on the issue of whistleblowing and protect, in particularly with, with fraud. One of the things that, that Thomas Mueller said that I thought was very fascinating was that whistleblowing is not just one law. It is an entire world of law. We, when we look at whistleblowing, we can consider the corporate situation or the government whistleblowing situation. So with corporate, you might see that there's a drug company, for example, that may be putting out a drugs and they haven't gone through the rigorous testing to find out what the side effects were. They've, they've kind of hidden the fact that, you know, if you take this drug, you might be have children that are bored and deformed. Um, but we're going to put this drug out, we're going to market the drug, and we're going to get the FDA to approve it and stuff like that. Um, if you are in that environment, you should blow the whistle because what could happen is that the children's lives, future children's lives could be at stake. Uh, there was a couple, there, not a couple, but there were two people at Hanford and they were very talented. And by the way, one was a very strong uh, Trump diehard supporter. The other one probably was a Bernie Sanders supporter. And, uh, and yet they both came out and they blew the whistle against Hanford um, with the, the nuclear waste that was being processed there, I believe that it was. They both were professional. They both wanted to have, they, they had this thing that they had to do right. And it was a very good thing because had there been an incident there, the Pacific Northwest would have been, become uninhabitable. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about them perhaps later on during the course of this. But um, that would be examples perhaps of some type of, of, of a corporate whistleblowing. Uh, maybe government whistleblowing at the same time. But I want to look at the government whistleblowing in the context of our anti-family courts. And by the way, going back again to the Continental Congress, um, the Continental Congress back in July 30th of 1778, this is what, where we get the National Whistleblower Appreciation Day on July the 30th. Uh, because on July 30th, 1778, the Continental Congress unanimously, unanimously passed a law after hearing testimony, I believe it was by 10 sailors, disclosing misconduct by the commander of the U.S. Navy for harming British prisoners and for dereliction of duty. And one of the things that came out of this is that it is not only the right, but it is the duty of all American citizens to report wrongdoing by public officials. And in the context of our family courts, these public officials would include our anti-family court judges. We have a lot of anti-family court judges, uh, judges that pretend like they're following the law and making it up on their own. We have not only the right to report them, we have the duty to report them because these judges are causing immense harm to children, to families, to our society, and they often are profiting by this fraudulent behavior. Uh, they, are, they are creating mistrust in the judiciary. I, for one, used to have trust in the judiciary. At this point in time, my trust is negative. I have no trust in the judiciary. I told one judge not too long ago, in the next two years, if you could bring my trust level in the judiciary up to zero, you'd be doing a tremendous thing. That's how bad it has gotten by watching what's taking place in these family courts, and not just the family courts, even the criminal courts as well. There's a couple of org there's a couple of places you can look for more whistleblowing activities. Whistleblowers.org, that's whistleblowers with an S dot org, or um, National Whistleblower Day dot org. Uh, National Whistleblower Day dot org. There's a YouTube channel that talks has some of these videos out there as well. And it talks about whistleblowing in particular. When we think about the word whistleblower, what comes to our mind? Is it a heroic truth teller or is it somebody who's a snitch, who's a turncoat, who's a traitor? And sometimes what it comes down to is how close is he to us. If he's exposing corruption over there with somebody else, the guy may be a hero and, and you know, valiant and we're going to idolize him. But if he's exposing wrongdoing of within our organization, within our government, now he's a snitch, now he's a traitor, now he's, he's just a mean, he's vengeful, he's, he's disgruntled, whatever the case may be. When it comes down to whistleblowers themselves, whistleblowers often are torn as far as what their, what their responses should be. Most people think of whistleblowers as being um, just rebels. But most whistleblowers try to use internal channels first. They want to blow the whistle in a sense, not because they want to be some type of hero. They want to just see the agency, the corporation they're working for, do the right thing. Tell the truth. 
do the right thing and the just thing toward people. Um, they believe that honesty is the best policy. Um, they believe that um, by by doing, by, by trying to reform the organizations from the inside, they are actually helping and providing a service to the organization. It depends upon um, where you are in the organization, whether you think that's the case or not. If you're up on top and you're thinking, man, this is going to cut into my profits, you might say that the whistleblower is a snitch. But again, the motivation of the whistleblower is to try to do the right thing. And the conflict within the whistleblower's mind is this. What do I stand for? Do I stand for truth and justice? Or do I want to go along to get along? Do I want to show loyalty to my team? Do I want to be a team player? Do I want to show appreciation to my workforce? Do I want to obey my boss? Or do I actually, if I'm not going to be heard through the channels that are established, do I need to take it a step further because what we are doing is going to be harming the public? Many whistleblowers don't want to make waves. They would rather just, I, I submitted my complaint, I did this, and I've washed my hands of the whole thing at this point in time. Because whistleblowing comes at a great personal cost in many instances. Um, how much does it cost a person to be a whistleblower when they really don't want to be? It may cost them money. It may cost them their career. They may be demoted. They may be considered a troublemaker. They may be blacklisted from their uh, workforce. Their reputation may be skewered and maligned. Um, they could be sued. We live in a sue-happy um, society, so you're going to make something, even though everybody knows that's true, we're going to find a way to shut you up by taking you to court and bankrupting you with legal fees, or else winning because you can't afford, you don't have the same deep pockets that we do. Um, there may be threats given to an individual or against his family. I've heard of instances where people's pets have been killed, as if it's a warning stop what you're doing. Um, violence may be perpetrated against them. Um, your family may be considered in danger. Whistleblowers have the conflict on the inside. The question is, and again, I mean, with, with whistleblowers, are they good, are they bad? I suppose it depends on, are they blowing the whistle on you or are they blowing the whistle on somebody else like your competitor? Um, we have to look at whistleblowers as actually performing a vital function in our society. It is a sad fact that we judge whether whistleblowers are good or bad depending upon who they're blowing the whistle on. If they're blowing the whistle on our competitor, they're good. If they're blowing the whistle on us because of our negligence and our deliction of duty and our fraud, they're bad. But we really need to be upholding whistleblowers as an essential element in our society to help preserve and enforce and, 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 and make a good and just society. So how does this all relate to our family courts? Um, and this is a big issue that I've been looking at as well because our anti-family courts in the state of Texas are a place where secrecy reigns, where injustice reigns, where fraud and corruption reigns, where deals struck behind closed doors is the normal practice of business, where a judge makes a determination based either upon his relationship with an attorney or a child custody evaluator or somebody else, or maybe because the judge doesn't like the way a person looks or acts, or he didn't feel respected enough by one person. You didn't beg him enough. This type of corruption is rampant throughout our anti-family courts in Texas. In fact, I said it was pervasive. One person told me, well, it's not really pervasive. It's just rampant. Well, it's rampant. So rampant that it appears to be almost pervasive. And one of the issues that we look at is with our anti-family courts is why the, why the secrecy? If you have nothing to hide in anti-family courts, why the secrecy? So you go into a court, you'd like to be able to record, and they tell you you can't record. They will try to take your phone away from you. They'll try to uh, take recording devices away. I've been patted down on several instances because they thought I was in the recording. Whether I was or wasn't, I can't tell you, but you know, I went through some pretty extensive searches at times, and, and I've had, um, you know, to the place that they were looking and they found nothing. And I, and I think it's probably because I've put out stuff online and um, that's fine. They can do whatever they want to, but why the secrecy? What is there to hide? Why are the judges so concerned that we might see what they're doing? Why are the judges um, hiding the abuse that takes place on a daily basis within their courts? When we talk about this whole idea of, of secrecy and, and uh, we can't let the public really know what we're doing. I mean, we're the judges, we know best. And, and we can't stand to be scrutinized or criticized by the public. Um, there's a little bit of hypocrisy here because these are the same people that would talk about how their courts are so just and so righteous. If they're so just and so righteous, why not let everybody see just how 
just and righteous they are. Well, we really can't do that, can we? Because that would blow the lid off of the whole game. And, you know, what judges will tell us, because I know one of the Republican judges up in Collin County said, we've got transcripts. Transcripts, even if you had a 100% transcript that was 100% faithful, a lot of communication is done non-verbally. In fact, some people say over 90% of communication is non-verbal. So even if you had a perfect transcript, you would still be missing 90% of the communication. You'd be missing the tone of voice. You'd be missing the threatening looks, the glances, the other things that take place there. So, but, but they don't want this to come out and to, and to be seen. They want to just say that, you know, we are going to make our decisions and we're going to be right. And judges, I think, have, are a little bit thin-skinned. They're afraid that they may be criticized over making in a wrong decision and if you are a judge you should be able to take the scrutiny if you are doing the right thing that's fine if you're doing the wrong thing you should be able to call be called out for it and you should be able to rectify a decision that you made but one thing that I think about with whistleblowing in the judiciary, as I've said, this is widespread. The, the corruption, the fraud, the abuse is widespread in the, in the judiciary. Where are the whistleblowers from within the industry? How come there are not attorneys that are blowing the whistles on judges that, that, uh, that regarding these practices that take place on a daily basis? Why is it that individuals like myself or like other people have to go into the courts and try to, to blow the whistle on these people and we get dismissed? Where are the attorneys? The attorneys are not acting in accordance with their ethical obligations when they are not reporting abusive judges, corrupt judges, when they're not recording, when they're not reporting judicial misconduct by another attorney. It's just as simple as that. If we had more judges, then why aren't judges blowing the whistles on attorneys? Another thing, because we know that attorneys are abusive and we know that judges let them get away with it. Why are the judges not reporting these attorneys to the bar filing ethical complaints against them. So what makes a whistleblower? I think the big thing about a whistleblower is that um, there's something about them that they have either a conscience, they have a code of ethics. According to Thomas Mueller, a whistleblower, generally speaking, they had certain characteristics. They had experience in their job, so maybe they had 10 years of experience, so they were able to trust what they knew was right about what they were doing. They knew the difference between right and wrong, and they had a strong moral code. They did not have 50 shades of gray in their morality. They had a black or white. It was right or it was wrong. And, um, and that was the one that came, perhaps it made them th to appear a little bit blunt at times, but once again, whistleblowers did not want to just come out and, 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 and be the, the person who upset the apple cart. They often tried to work through the channels. In fact, a lot of these places, like even in our state when it comes down to the family courts, well, have you tried to appeal the decision? The channels are in place to shut you up, to give you the appearance that something is really going to take place. It is very seldom that a family court judge will be overruled by an appellate court down the road. They say, well, you can also report to the State Commission on Judicial Conduct. I have done at least half a dozen complaints. I've given plenty of evidence, and I always get the response back, well, we really didn't find anything. Thank you for your complaint, however. And I've talked with people at the State Commission on Judicial Conduct, and they've said as well, they don't have the money and the resource to investigate some of these things. If they do, the judges can ask for a new trial. The whole system is set up to protect corrupt judges, to protect corrupt attorneys. That's just the way that it is. So we've now institutionalized fraud and corruption within our family court systems. Um, to be very blunt about this, I mean, I don't know what else to say about the family courts except that it's a massive BS game. That's all it is. It's a massive BS game. You go into the courts, you sit in and you watch, and you're like, this is incredibly insane. It's corrupt, it's fraudulent, it is complete BS, it's massive. And yet the people that make their money off of the system They've learned to play the game. So a whistleblower, though, does not play the game very well. To the whistleblower, it's right or it's wrong, it's black or it's white. We don't have 50 shades of gray, as these attorneys do, as these family court judges do, as the appellate court judges appear to have, as members of the certain members of the SCJC appear to have, as members of our legislators seem to have. We have to, we have to make the presumption that the judges are acting in the best interest of the of of the of the litigation against the, we have to make the assumption that the discretion is right we have to give them the presumption that they're doing
doing the right things. Now it's interesting because this is the only profession that I'm aware of <laughs> that we give that presumption to. And look at what they do and the destruction that they cause. So with regard to the anti-family lotless industry, I mean they have people and procedures in place supposedly to, to be a check on them. The reality is the channels just give the appearance of, of justice and like they're looking at something. They are designed to choke you out of the system. Now our history in the United States is replete with uh, corporations committing fraud, with people dying because of fraud, with very bad things taking place because of fraud and corruption and deceit. Our anti-family court judges and our anti-family court systems are just as liable, just as guilty, have done just as many atrocities as some of these corporations have and yet we have no way to hold them to an account. With regard to the uh, the, the anti-family court side, the whole anti-family industry, uh, and it is an industry, make no, no mistake about it. I was reading again this morning that the anti-family industry is about an $80 billion a year industry. Now, if you're making $80 billion off of fraud and deceit, um, you're gonna wanna protect your industry, and that's exactly what they do. So, for example, the uh, anti-family law industry has their lobbyists. Um, Steve and Amy Bresnan, these people of just such wonderful integrity, just such kind-hearted people. These are people that uh, have called fathers terrorists, uh, deadbeats, they've accused them of not wanting to support their children. They make up all sorts of things. Uh, and yet, and these are the people, these are the attack dogs for the anti-family law system. These are the ones that they will go to the legislature and they'll say, well, here's what we have found out. They, it's a bunch of crap. It's complete crap. It's not even like 99% crap. It's 100% crap, if not even more than 100%. These people are just defending the industry. That's why they are lobbyists. They are divorce attorney lobbyists, they are family law lobbyists. What do lobbyists do? They do that which makes their clients money. That's all that they care about. The ethics, oh, will pretend to give some a nod to ethics, but really what they're doing is they're protecting the industry. And Steve and Amy Bresnan make a, a lot of money as lobbyists, um, and they will be the attack dogs for the uh, divorce attorneys, and they will even call in some of the worst judges in the state of Texas, like Judith Wells, to testify on behalf of a bill <laughs> that they were supporting. Anybody who knows Judith Wells knows that why I am laughing about this. Uh, one of the, I believe, one of the most corrupt judges in the state of Texas, once again in Tarrant County, uh, and they had her come and testify on behalf of a bill that was simply atrocious. Uh, this happened just last session. But again, these anti-family lobbyists, um, Steve and Amy Bresnan, um, what they want to do then, they attack people who, who criticize the industry. I won't even call it a profession. I will call it an industry. It may be a criminal racketeering enterprise. It is an industry. It's, it's an enterprise, whatever it may be. They will try to make fathers or mothers appear that they're just disgruntled. They're angry. They're just vengeful. Um, they're insane people. They're just crazy. They'll try, they're narcissistic. They're unstable. Um, well, maybe we need to get, they, we like to see their psychological evaluation. Now, these are people that I think we would love to see their psychological evaluation. Steve is 28 years older than his wife. Uh, his wife was being born when Steve was 28 years old. They're married as a couple, happily married, evidently. But I still think that there's some other issues that are behind that. And I wonder if a good psychological test may not point out some of these issues that perhaps are uh, within uh, Steve and Amy Bresnan, especially Amy. Amy is a... Uh Amy can be a real gem at times. Amy Bresnan, I just want to thank you for all the things that you say because you provided us a treasure grove of tweets and everything else. Um, but then, you know, they may attack their politics. They will attack their honesty. They'll do anything possible that they can to try to uh, attack a person who's blowing the whistle on this entire industry. They will buy legislators. They will try to influence legislators by saying, let me tell you what, we, what, what the other side is really saying. They will lie. We have it on record. We have them lying about things. Um, we, we have them trying to skewer people. Anyway, so what was I gonna say here? Um, the whistleblower, you know, the whistleblower, how do you fight a whistleblower? Uh, you have the attack dog lobbyists, the anti-family lobbyists like Steve and Amy Bresnan, to denigrate people, to attack them, to call them all sorts of things. Um, again, I mean, they also tell you too, well, just use the channels. But what they're not telling people to use the channels is that they're working behind the scenes, trying to make sure that the channel gets choked right here so that you've sent something through the channel and it gets back with a rejection. Again, I know this, I've submitted 
multiple requests of the State Commission on Judicial Conduct with plenty of evidence, and they just don't quite see it. Appeal it. Oh, well, but the, see, appealing is good because if you appeal something, you know, that means you're spending more money. You're making money for the attorneys. And Steve and Amy Bresnan love that. Well, you can always appeal it. And, and that is another trick that they use to bring in money for the industry. The cost of not whistleblowing um, is huge. If it's in a corporate situation, there was a, a Boeing death. Uh, I think Boeing was building a 740. I don't remember what the plane was, but you know there were people inside the corporation that knew that Boeing was taking shortcuts, and they didn't say enough. And as a result, they had a plane that went headfirst into the ground, 600 miles an hour, killed 346 people. A whistleblower would have been very welcome there. Um, Hanford. Uh, Hanford over in Washington State. They were going to go online. I believe it had something to do with um, nuclear waste. Had they gone online, it could have made the entire Pacific North area, Northwest area, uninhabitable for years. Fortunately, there were two people that went forward, blew the whistle. Um, again, one person was a very strong Trump supporter. One person was a, a person who would have supported Bernie. Um, but they both had a strong internal code of ethics in doing right. They both had the courage to break with their toxic teams and to disobey illegal orders. They both reported things internally and they, they reported things again and again. They escalated their warnings. Finally, when there was no hope within the system, they went outside of the system and they reported wrongdoing at their own cost and expense. And like the family court system in Texas, we've gone through the system again and again and again. There is no remedy at law. There's no remedy within the system. That's why we're going outside of the system. That's why we are blowing the whistle to the best that we can on the whole anti-family court industry. And the lobbyists, Steve and Amy Bresnan, and I have to wonder if there are some legislators that are not also in their back pockets. If you look at some donations, you'll see, yes, indeed, they really are. Um, these are, were also people, Walt and, um, and Donna, they were people that they were gonna decide to do the, the right thing no matter what the cost. And the cost for them, what was the, what was the reward for them whistleblowing? They were retaliated against. They were demoted, they were fired. They were blackballed from the industry even though they were both experts in the industry. This type of actions, retaliation, it's cruel, it's illegal, it's counterproductive. Uh, it just should not happen, but this happens again and again and again. Why? Because fraud is a big industry. Fraud can rake in billions and billions of dollars. In the anti-family court industry, fraud brings in $80 billion a year, according to an article that I read this morning. So with regard to whistleblowers, I encourage you, if you're watching, be a whistleblower. If you see something, say something. Isn't that what the test data always tells us? If you see something, say something. Don't be silent. And I know that for me, seeing something and saying something has gotten me in trouble on some occasions. You know, so um, you, you see something and then all of a sudden now you're the troublemaker. Well, I thought you wanted me to see something and say something. And by the way, um, if you, you do have a citizen, you have not only the right to report public corruption, you have a duty to report public corruption. So whistleblowers who do this, they should not be viewed as traitors and turncoats and, and on all sorts of things. They actually should be looked at people that would say, you know what, they're fighting for the good of our society. They're fighting for our good of our children. They're fighting for the good um, so that we can trust the judiciary. I know of so many people who have no trust in the judiciary, it's, we laugh at it, it's a mockery. It's nothing that deals with justice. We distrust our entire third branch of government. That's how bad it is. And if you're a legislator, I'm gonna tell you this, you need to be seeking out whistleblowers. Who are the whistleblowers that are in your district? You should be talking to them on a regular basis. Come on and tell us what's going on. Don't just say, oh, these are the fringe people. That's, that's another thing. The, the whistleblowers are fringe people. Oftentimes, they're the people who've seen it and who can tell you stories, who can write volumes about the injustices, the cruelty, the fraud that's taking place. And yet our legislators act as if, well, they aren't really that important to the fringe people. 
because perhaps maybe the legislators themselves are, are, are profiting from the fraud. I don't know. But if you're a legislator, you should be seeking out these people that would be known as whistleblowers, people that have blown the whistle on injustice within our society. Anyway, um, that's basically kind of it for right now. Once again, July the 30th is National Whistleblower Appreciation Day. Uh, this was something that was um, passed unanimously by the Continental Congress in July 30th, 1778, after hearing the testimony of 10 sailors, 10 sailors, I believe it was, who disclosed misconduct against the commander of the U.S. Navy for harming British citizens and for dereliction of duty. It is the right and it is the duty of all American citizens to report wrongdoing by public officials, and that includes our anti-family court judges. I hope to see you reporting on their misconduct as well. Thank you.